Keep it real, you need to kill yourself. Don't do this shit, bitch. What up, dog? It's your host, Young Tony, man. We back on the Black Shot Podcast, episode 13, season 2. Hey, shout out to our sponsors, man. Uh, EL Turnage, uh, LLC. Uh, Seductive Stallions, LLC. Folks over there doing great work. Shout out to them. All right, today we're going to get right into it. Um, today, the episode, we're going to cover three topics as usual. Uh, the first one, being black uh, in business. And uh, what's the connection between being black and being in business? Question two, does college slash university degrees matter anymore? Do they hold the same weight? Uh, especially if you have the... Uh, Practical skill set. And three is a goodie. Normally we do two, you know, serious topics and one lighthearted. But this last topic we're going to get into is a rather serious topic. And it's uh, African American vernacular English or AAVE and black language code switching. So let's jump right into the first topic. Uh, Being in business. What is the connection between being black and being in business? Well, in the American context, to be in business is to be American, right? Um, in the words of Nipsey Hussle, being broke is so un-American. It's the worst thing you can do as an American is be poor or to not uh, be rich. And so most of the inhabitants of the continental United States, the United States in whole, uh, are just above the poverty line, right? And... Well, actually, most of us are just above or just below the poverty line um, when you look at the numbers, right? Um, And so, to be in business, what does that mean? That means to be in commerce uh, for currency, not necessarily just, uh, you know, the exchange of goods and services, but the exchange of goods and services for currency. And that's the big difference is the currency piece, you know, the, the... What can I trade for this note, uh, promissory note, or what have you? And so, uh, in in 2023, you can't graduate high school in most states with a legitimate certification that will get you paid outside of very select markets. And that's based on schools having uh, robust programs that are survived the uh, the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s, right? Most schools, high schools in major metropolitan areas uh, up until, you know, roughly 1975, you could graduate uh, with a license in a trade, plumber, electrician, carpenter, etc., steel worker, yada, 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 right? Or you could go right into working at the plant just like your father and your father's father, so forth and so on, right? Uh, me, I grew up in Detroit, so we had the big three and the post office. Coming out of high school, you could go work for Chrysler GM or you could go to the USPS, right? That was like the big thing. And then um, it kind of slowed down as the economy changed over time, right? We went more tech and less industrialization. And so being black in business, business has always been uh, a white dictated space on a commercial level uh, in major metropolitan areas. Now we have pockets, don't get me wrong. We had our various thriving smaller cities, you know, your, your Greenwood districts in Oklahoma, your, your black Wall Street streets, uh, your section is like Liberty City, Miami, uh, um, Jackson, Mississippi had a section. Uh, we had several of them through Texas. Uh, Chicago was a booming black metropolitan area. Detroit was a me- booming black metropolitan area. St. Louis was a booming black metropolitan area. Different parts of California. Um, you know, Buffalo at one point. So forth and so on, right? You had all these metropolitan areas that were booming with black people doing commerce, that that exchange of, of, of goods and services, and in the American context, for currency. And so, as we know, 
history happened and collections of non-black people had problems with us. And I'm going to blatantly say it. White folks had a problem with black folks making money and working together and being successful and oftentimes being more successful than them. And it was poor white people who had the biggest problem because they felt because they were white, they should have a better quality of life than us. Well, you should only have a better quality of life than me if you can work harder than me and you can be more productive than me and you are better with the skill set than me. If you don't work harder, aren't more productive and don't have a better skill set or you're not better at the equivalent skill set, you should not have a better quality of life than me regardless of what ethnicity you come from. Doesn't matter where you came from in the world. Doesn't matter. If you're not out here doing the work in a, in a comparable fashion, in an equivalent fashion, why should your quality of life be better than mine? If you're not out here doing the work. Now, before people grab that and try to run with it and try to flip it, well, what about affirmative action? Or what about uh, equity diversion, uh, uh, equity and, and, and the DI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? What about those programs? Those programs were created to offset and balance out the unbalanced economy that was generated by white people hating to see the failure of white people and the subsequent success of other people, predominantly black people. As an African, born and raised in America, and if you don't believe me, yes, I am Nigerian, and I can, I can attest to the efforts and the results of our people and the problems that we were put into and the restrictions that were put upon us because someone else did not like our level of success in their given industry or area of life. And so, and, you know, many people had a, had a problem, man. And, and it was, it, it was blatant that they had a problem. You know, they didn't hide the fact that they didn't like it. And so to be black and in business in today's economy is to fight through things like microaggressions. It's to fight through things like uh, discriminatory hiring practices. Excuse me. To, to fight through things like social equality in the workplace. Now I'm bald. I, I know I can grow a full head of, 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 of luscious, strong, wonderful African hair. Um, but I've had just about every major hairstyle you can think of. I've had several different uh, variations of fades. Uh, I've had locks. I've had braids. I've had a fro. And yeah, though I'm bald today, I will say it. No, white people, you can't just come touch our fucking hair. And no, you can't discriminate against us and have unfair hiring practices because you don't like our fucking hair. No, you can't kick us out of school because you disagree with our fucking hair. I eat the Crown Act. And they make all of these different fucking rules to marginalize and uh, displace us in every industry because they don't like how we do business. In large part due to our pro productivity is so much greater than theirs when given the same ease of process, the same tools for education, the same uh, level of equity and access to information and resources and funding. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's been a, 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 a big disparity in business. 
you know, why is it that I can Google a business? I can Google an industry, not even a particular singular business. I can Google an industry. Pick an industry. You can Google an industry. Nine times out of ten, a black business is not going to be the leader in that industry. They're not even going to be the first business that comes up on Google. Why is that? Because there's so many businesses in the given industry that are owned and operated and decided upon by non-black people. And to the point to where we have to make registries of all the black owned businesses. There's not a registry of all the white owned businesses. And if there is, there's not one that I know of. And if there is, it's not it's 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 not put out for public consumption. Why? Because the expectation is most of the businesses are white anyway. At no point was it illegal for a given group of people, non black, to own businesses. It wasn't. It wasn't say it wasn't against the law for you to own business. You weren't considered less than a fucking person. You weren't considered you weren't legally codified as less than a human. You weren't. So in business, you were not frozen out of doing business. Maybe in a given area of the country. But you know what? You look at Asians. They come from a variety of countries in Asia. And oftentimes, they have a system that supports them being over here. Not every time, but often. They have a system that supports them being over here. They come here. They group together. They practice group economics. They play as a team. They sacrifice as a team. They vote as a team. They invest as a team. And you know what they do? They succeed as a team. There's a little India. And it's... Oh, uh, correction. There's there's a little... There's there's a little Chinatown. And in this little Chinatown, who who runs that area? The Chinese, duh. That's why it's called Chinatown. And why? What makes it Chinatown? Not because there's a lot of Chinese people there. Well, not exclusively because there's a lot of Chinese people there. It's Chinatown to the masses because of ignorance. Because many times there's Chinese, there's Vietnamese, there's uh, folks from Laos, there's Cambodians, there's Koreans, right? There's, uh, you know, Filipino. There's, 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 There's a whole mix of folks from Asia in this area, but it's commonly referred to as Chinatown because in large part it's ran by the Chinese. But you see Chinese owned and operated businesses. You see Chinese residents. What do you do? Oh, I I uh, run uh, uh, you know, a backroom gambling house out the basement of this building. But on the first floor, you know, uh, I do uh, 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 local. Pro- I do a local protection agency. You know, or uh, uh, I run. I run a laundry. I run a laundry mat. But my family lives upstairs. It's nine of us in a two bedroom. Right, all in the same building. You got something going on on the top floor. You got something going on on the middle floor. You got something going on on the bottom floor, right? But people living and working in the same buildings, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 that's on it. That's on every street. Who owns the liquor store? This Asian family. Who owns that market there? Another Asian family. And what are they doing? They're facilitating an Asian-based economy. They, they're, they're importing their food from whatever country they would get their food or whatever vendors they would get their food from if they was back in their country. You know, if they had kikuman soy sauce back in their country, they got kikuman soy sauce in Little China over here. You know, if they had General Souls, General Soul Chicken, 
They got General So Chicken. They had orange chicken there. They had orange chicken here. Same thing. You know, if they was hanging chickens in the window over there, they had the chickens in the window over here. All they did was change the the phys the all they did was change the physical location they was at on the map, but they brought their culture with them, right? They brought their economics with them, right? So being black in business, we uh, we ran things like the juke joints, the saloons, the gambling houses, right? That's what the whole movie Harlem Nights was about. It was about black business. Barbershop was about black business. These are these these are, these are staples in the black community, and it was all about black business. You look at you look at most of these black exploitation films, right? Where we pimps and hoes and gangsters and junkies and you know the number runners and this, that, and the third. You know, and 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 when you look at it, yeah, you might see a degradation of the people. But you got to look at the fact that these are folks engaging in business. And today, in 2023, we have a higher registration of legitimate business than we've had in the last mm, maybe 100 years. You go back to 1923. Do we have this many, many black business owners? Potentially. We might even have more. You have to go crunch the numbers. But then in order to do that, there had to be a registry. And why don't we know how many black-owned businesses we had in 1923? I mean, potentially we do. You just might have to go state by state. But is that is that publicly taught knowledge? No. Why? Because if you show the greatness of a people and then you've diminished that greatness by teaching that, this, that these people were once great in whatever capacity, gives way to them repeating said greatness. And lo and behold, black people exhibit some greatness and it's continuous. Folks gonna have a fucking hissy fit. So, uh, being black in business effectively means you've got to work harder to get half as much. you got to work twice as hard to get half as much. And unfortunately, that's still the metric. I don't have to compete with my fellow black man. I have to collaborate with my fellow black man. I don't have to compete with my with my fellow black sister. I have to collaborate with my fellow black sister. So I'm looking to put businesses together and I tear them apart. If you got a business doing a thing and you got a business doing the same thing and both of y'all are struggling, it makes sense for y'all to work together so y'all business survive, right? If y'all making clothes, come up with come up with summer collections, fall collections, right? You know, if you trying to print shirts, you trying to print shirts, and this person got a printing press, hey man, y'all put your money together and pay this pay this person to print your shirts. And then you can publicize their printing press by saying, hey, all our merchandise is exclusively printed over here. Done. Three-way deal, trying to paperwork, everybody getting to the bag. That part. All right, man, next topic. Um, this college degrees... And university, does college and university degree still matter? Mm, unless you're working in a field that requires a state license, for the most part, no, it don't. I've been telling people for the last couple of months, stop going into debt to learn something you can learn for the price of your internet. YouTube University. For real. You want to go to college and you want to spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to sit in a classroom and do case studies and learn theory and concept when you can take less than a day's salary and one of them professors you just had to listen to for the last four years, you can take less than a day's salary in cost. Find you a company that finds you a, a private practice for that does the thing you're trying to do and shadow them. 
hell. And half of those folks will let you pick their brain for the cost of lunch. You go, hey, you know, you, you find a, a local company. If you wanted to be a dentist, I was telling this to a, to a, a young lady a couple of weeks ago. She explained that she wanted to be a dentist. And I said, well, get on, you know, get on YouTube. Once you pick the state you want to get certified in, get on YouTube and look up the certification process to be a dentist. Okay, you got to have this amount of credit hours. Um, you got to fill out these forms. You got to take this exam. It's going to cost you X amount of dollars. Great. Then go get whatever... And then go um, find a private practice. Go find a dentist. You know, call them up and ask them if you can meet them for lunch. Because you're interested in becoming a dentist and you have whatever set of credentials you have now and you have whatever level of knowledge you have now. See if you can meet them for lunch. And you want to pick their brain about how they set up their business. And find out, you know, what... What program, you know, how big of a business do they run? How many patients can they see at a time? You know, what's their patient load per week, per month, per year? You know, how many staff members do they have? What 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 program do they use to do their scheduling? What program do they use to do their invoicing? You know, what's their income in a year? What what got them into being a dentist? What are some of the hurdles that they face going into private practice? Did they ever work for a dentist before becoming their own dentist? Did, you know what I'm saying? Kind of get a feel for their journey. And you might learn the bulk of that. Not all of it, but the bulk of it. You might learn the bulk of it over lunch. Or day off day. And see if you can just come shadow them. Like you're not actually doing any work. You're not actually necessarily engaging with the patients, but you, you're you're observing, you're asking questions, you're you're getting a feel for how the business works, because if you got the qualifications, if you got the level of knowledge, then you know how to do it. But how do you run that as a business? Go shadow these folks. I was talking to a young man a couple months back. Um, he was in the Navy, and. Uh, he was like, he was always good with, with his hands and he liked to weld. And I said, hey, man, go find you one of these steel working companies that do welding and go pick their brains on how they set up their company, whether or not they're independent contractors or they work for uh, a company that does the contracting for them. You know, are they freelance? Go see if you can shadow them on a job or, or you know, go pick their brains. How do they set up their business? And you don't need to go to college for this. And since you're in the military, all you got to do is sign up, is find a trade school, not a four-year university, it's only a trade school. It's going to be drastically more efficient. It's going to cost you less money. And it's going to get you to your certification faster. On, on the military's dime, nonetheless. And in that way, you know, while you're while you're shadowing these people and while you go to this school, pick a company, pick a state, file for a business, and use the use the information you're learning from these companies that you're shadowing and put that into practice in your business. Find out how they set up their marketing, find out how they set up their invoicing, find out how they set up their work schedule, what what kind of variables goes into their job analysis so forth and so on right and you don't need a college degree to do that and if the military is going to pay for you to go to this training school go so when you decide that you're tired of dealing with the military hey amen kick your boots off for the last time and go do what you enjoy doing and now you got a full-fledged business that you can do that in the name of and make you some real money and pass that money down to your people's Pass that money down to the kids you may have someday. Even if you don't have no kids. Oh, you got a little brother. Pass that down to your little brother. You know, if you got a white, you know, pass it down to them. You know what I'm saying? Generate, generate some wealth in your name. In your family's name. Right? And you don't got to go to college to do this. 
I keep telling folks, stop going to college for something you can learn for the price of your internet. You already pay a phone bill, and your phone bill affords you access to a wonderful application card, YouTube. YouTube University. In the words of Tiffany Haddish, fuck college. YouTube that shit. Straight up. You want to learn how to file a business? Go on YouTube. They'll walk you through it step by step. Wow, people who file businesses were like, here's how you do it. Go to this website. Type in this. Pull up this form. Here's how you do it. Here's how you type this in. Here's how you type that in. Here's what this means. Here's what this means. Dang, you, you find your business. Okay, next step. Oh, you gotta get a you didn't file you didn't file for your LLC. Oh, your next step is you gotta get a you gotta get a federal EIN. Done. Next thing, next thing you gotta you gotta get a business bank account. Well, here's some business bank account options. If you wanna go the traditional route, here's some good banks and here's some options. If you wanna go the freelance route, here's some online bank and here's some options. You YouTube that shit. You, you paying the phone bill. You paying for the internet. So for the cost of your internet, you can learn in, you know, a few months what you will be qualified, what you would have learned in a few years. Now, mind you, you got to take the time to cipher through because it's a lot of information. And you got to take the time to watch all these videos and pick out the nuggets and do the work. But you doing the work at your own pace. For, for the cost of your internet bill. You know. Now. Once again. I'm going to say this. If the field you want to get into. Requires a no shit license. Go to school for it. Nursing. Go to school for it. Lawyer. Go to school for it. Any trade. Go to trade school for it. You do not have to go. Be, you do not have to go to school to be an architect. To go be some. To go be a, a carpenter. Go to trade school. Get certified as a carpenter. Go to trade school. Get certified as a, an electrician. You do not have to have a degree in electric engineering to go be an electrician. Excuse me. Go get certified as an electrician. Because if you honestly, if you go get certified as an electrician, and you pay uh, a junior or a senior who's an electric electrical engineering major, they can probably tutor you on the first two years of school and you can potentially sign up and test out of those classes. So if you really want that degree, those first two years where you're doing general ed and one maybe you may you may be doing three general ed classes and one core class, man, listen. You knock out them general ed classes so quick, and you can probably test out some of them, some of them lower level general ed classes if you're smart, and some of them lower level uh, core classes. Why? Because you got a tutor, somebody who done been there and done that, and you're a certified electrician. So then you can go make paper, and you can afford to go to college with less debt. That motherfucking part. So in my opinion. No, it does not make logistical sense or logical sense, separate, but both equal, equally valuable points. It does not make logistical or logical sense as a business mind to go to college for something that doesn't require you to have a state issued license. It don't. It's not necessary. If you want to do it, by all means, go and do it. It's your money. But. For the people who really want to do it and ain't got the means to pay for that shit out of pocket, and you don't want to, you don't want to generate all that debt, and you don't have a, a, a secondary system for somebody else to pay for that shit to where you don't got to pay them back, i.e., you being in the military, you got all these scholarships, some some company is fronting the bill for you. Don't go to college wasting your money. Go to trade school. Go get a tutor. That part. All right. So, last topic. Last topic for the day. African American vernacular English and Black language code switching. This is um a very 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 important topic to me, um because as a black person, 
an African born and raised in America, uh, an African American, and with the air quotes, if you will, right? So, as a black man, I've had a very distinct experience in America. Like I said, I was born and raised in Detroit. Um, and yes, I'm Nigerian for real. My mother is Nigerian, and in Africa, you take the lineage of your mother, not your father. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as a black man in America, very distinct experience, right? Um, growing up in a predominantly black city, my social encounters were predominantly black, though my systemic encounters were white controlled and i have to say that because though detroit is roughly 80 percent black and has been my entire lifetime mind you i'm 34 um it's always been white money that controlled the functionality the big wigs in michigan yeah detroit's black most of michigan ain't just that motherfucking part. There's Detroit, and then there's the rest of Michigan, right? You got your black pot. You got your black pockets. You got your Flints, your Saginaws, your your Ypsilanti's, right? You know your pockets in Kalamazoo. But uh, really, outside of that, Michigan is like white, like heavy on the heavy on the WH, white. It's Republican and white. It is gun toting, hunting in the is 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 hunting in the summer. You know, hunt, hunting in the summer, fishing in the spring. White. It's you know, football. It's it's American football. Uh, September to February. Uh, you know. March, April, May, basketball, track, lacrosse, softball, uh, I mean, baseball, lacrosse, track, softball, volleyball, you know what I'm saying? It's swim, it's, it's, it's swimming all June, July, August, and it's, it is white, and I have to say it like that, because if you've ever been a black person from a predominantly black area, and then you go spend time in predominantly white areas and you see how they operate. You understand the white. Um, so you understand the expression of little white. It's not, not, it's not southern because we're, we're from the Midwest, right? We're northern as compared comparatively to the south. But it's that it's that Midwestern. The systems were dictated by white people and white money. The the systems. What I mean by the systems, right? Your school boards. Who's delineating funds to the school board? Who's writing the curriculum? White folks. Who's delineating funds to the school board? White folks. Governors. White. Representatives. White. Congressmen. White. Founders, white. And when I mean white, I mean the French, the British, the German, the Dutch, the Italian, you know, white, European. Hell, Detroit is Detroit is is the English pronunciation of the French word Detroit. Like, un, du, toi, quatre, yeah. You know, like, tu parles vous français? Je m'appelle young, ton de mène, et toi? French, right? We wear, we wear Cartier glasses. Cartier? Properly pronounced Cartier. French. So, uh, white money controlled the systems. And white, 
ideology controlled the systems. So the schooling systems were set up based on American English, right? They were also set up based on the European style of, 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 of academic thought and process, which means students set in individualized chairs with wooden tops on them, desks. You, you had individualized chair desk combinations, 50, roughly 50 minutes a class, six classes a day, with at least one of them being some sort of athletic style instruction. Whether you got to go to the playground, i.e. recess, you got to go to the gym uh, for free play, you had physical education, a PE where you had to wear goofy ass looking shorts and a school t-shirt. Um, you had, uh, in, in high school, they would substitute that athletic style class for uh, ROTC or uh, football class or wrestling class or basketball or baseball class, etc. Excuse me, it was a little parched water bottle. Um, so the systems were white. And I'm making that point because when you talk about African-American vernacular English and black language and code switching, as a uh, African person born and raised in America, African-American, the expectation is that I am to be taught and prove proficient in American English. That's the expectation from the country, the expectation from the state was that I proved proficient in American English to a given level of, satisfac uh, of satisfaction. Can I read, write, and regurgitate to a 75% completion rate or better? It's been, it's been a standard, right? Hey, man, as long as you can get three quarters of the stuff, we can pass them. Easy peasy. Gone to the next grade, right? You got, a set, you got somewhere between 70, 75, you pass. Easy. CC, you, you got a C average. Let's move on. So that's the, that's the national expectation, that's the state expectation. But growing up in Detroit, the D, what up, though? What up, though, my baby? You good? African-American vernacular English. We spoke, excuse me, a system. We spoke a language that was a system, that was a systemic uh, process of uh, zero compulas, double negatives, colloquialisms, and um, and um, conjunctions of words that articulated a given state of existence and past, present, and future tense. That sounds like a lot. And what that effectively means is I said a bunch of things in a manner that doesn't fit into, into American English, but it's very common for African Americans. For example, American English says when you greet a person earlier in the day, good morning, how are you? My name is, and you are, and they would go, good morning, I'm well, how are you? My, I am so-and-so, it's a pleasure to meet you, right? African-American vernacular English says, coming from Detroit specifically, says, what up, though? I, I'm going to tell him, what should I? Oh, okay, cool, 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 peace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you good? Oh, cool, man. What y'all about to get into? Now, 
different terminology, same meaning, same implication. It's effectively, and hear me well, effectively its own language. It has rules. It has regulations. It has the continue the the habitual be. The habitual be. It describes a state of continuous action or a continuate or a continuous uh, functionality of a given verb, given action, right? The repetition of a given action. For example, he, she be hooping like a motherfucker. What that means is he plays basketball a lot. He be hooping. Not he he plays basketball. He used to play basketball. He's currently playing basketball. No, the habitual B takes out the con the, the necessity for separating past, present, and future tense of a action. When you want to say that someone has done a thing, is doing the thing, and is going to do the same exact action, and you expect them to keep doing that action, is the habitual be? He be hooping. Oh, you know, hey, y'all say y'all y'all say Devin, which Devin? Light skinned Devin. You know, he be hooping down at uh at P Walk. Oh yeah, I seen him at the uh I seen him at the barber shop on Etsy. See what I mean? It describes the repetitive nature of the re the repetition for past, present, and future tense of a given activity. And it says that someone does this thing habitually. They do this thing regularly. So the expectation, it lets you know that they've done it, that they're probably doing it right now. Or they've done it in recent time. And they're going to do it again in, in, a very, in, a, in a very near future, right? Next couple of days, couple of hours. That's the habitual B. Um, been. B-E-E-N. Right? The past tense. Um, been. Done. Been. Gone. Um, and the in, putting the emphasis on the word been implies a degree of time that has passed for a given activity. Example, man, y'all seen the new Spider Man, bro? We been seeing that new Spider Man. That shit whack. Means that I that I saw it a long time ago. There's been some um, large amount of time since I've done whatever the given action was, i.e., seen Spider Man. Hey, y'all heard this song? Man, we been heard that song. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Terminology such as, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I am talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Do you understand? Exclamation point. Or do you understand? Question mark. You dig? You dig? You dig? All I did was change the emphasis. And one went from a statement to a question. Because I changed the inflection on the, the statement, you dig. Y-O-U-D-I-G. You dig. Is the AAVE equivalent of 
do you understand? Or, no, I'm talking about, you dig it? Yeah, see, she did. She understands. She relates. You understand. You relate. And the reason I picked this particular topic for today, <laughs> let me backtrack before I get into that. Um, so AAVE uh, used to be called Ebonics. Originally, uh, originally coined Ebonics. Uh, circa 1975, it was a way to politically identify the combination of colloquialisms, uh, zero compulas, and double negatives, i.e., you dig, ain't got, not don't have, ain't got, not none, not none at all. Nan one, you know, things like that. When they when they introduced the word ink into the dictionary, circa nineteen ninety five, yeah. Hey, excuse me, can I borrow some butter? We ain't got no butter. Not we don't have any butter. We ain't got no. Yeah, that's like a triple negative. So, uh, circa nineteen seventy five. Uh, the term Ebonics was coined to identify and negatively politically label the common tongue of black people in America as a means to degrade them and effectively disregard them and their level of competency via their articulation and to label them as ignorant people who lacked the oratorical skills to prophetically and effectively communicate. We were assumed to lack the mental capacity and subsequent required skill sets to advance ourselves as a people politically. And in order to do that, they had to craft a propaganda campaign. And one of those angles were our speech. So they gave us a political term for our speech, i.e. Ebonics. What many of those white people in Coons, you know, the, 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 the black people in white face, um, didn't count on was that by giving us a political identity, by giving us a political identity for our common tongue and or language, or as people like to classify it, uh, dialect of English, it's a whole language. It, it, it has its own set of rules and boundaries and people who enforce those rules and boundaries so that it is expressed and understood adequately, which makes it a language. Um, it gave us the mechanism to establish that language and it forced people to use it in conversation. And now, because you had a name for it and you could identify it, you had to acknowledge its existence. You can't say that's Casper the Friendly Ghost, but not identify that it's a ghost. Yeah, you 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 have to um, give it a name, and by giving it a name, you gave way to its existence, man. And we use that in. Um, our advancement, whereas people try to use it in our uh, degradation or use it in our in our recession. No, African American vernacular English is a language. That's why you have to get. That's why you have it. So you gave it a name. You can't say, "Oh, it's this." You can't say, "Oh, well, that's a chicken honk." 
you can't give something a name, but then disregard its existence. It, it you you know it exists. You gave it a name. The name is there. It's African American vernacular English. It's the common tongue for black people in America. Yes, we are the gatekeepers of said language. And the only reason that they don't want to identify it as a language is because you would have to then associate the origin of that language to a given group of people. And you can't say that we have a language called African American Vernacular English. And we also have a group of people called African Americans. And then not credit the African American with the African American Vernacular English. You can't. That just, it, it, it doesn't work. So knowing that we as a people have our own language, you're going to try to discredit the language so that you can continuously discredit the people and therefore continue the perpetuation of the degradation of those people. You, you have all of these people who you brought over, who you had all these people who are descendants of the slaves that you brought over here and then add on the additional immigrants from various countries where you dropped off other slaves or where you took other slaves or you took the original slaves from and then every other country in between that's migrated over here to take advantage of the booming polit of the booming economic and political systems right and those of us with african origin i.e. the caribbean yes i'm i'm talking to you puerto rico i'm talking to you uh haiti and 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 dominican republic I'm talking to you, Turks and Caicos. I'm talking to you, uh, West Indies, which is dumb. Notice this thing is the West Indies, because that's short for Western India, and there's only one India. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you, Central America. I'm talking to you, South America. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Jamaica. I'm talking to you, Cuba. Yeah, all of these African people and all these African people and indigenous folks who were either slaughtered and extinct or picked up from Africa, dropped off in these remote islands and forced to 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 and forced into slavery with the uh, aboriginal people of those lands. And then you produced black folks. Um, you don't argue with the Jamaican on whether or not he owns Patwa. You don't argue with the Indian on whether or not he owns Hindi. You don't argue with the Iraqi, the Iranian, the Afghanistanian, the the the, the Palestinian, the 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 uh, the Saudi Arabian. You don't argue with the Saudis about whether or not they can gatekeep Arabic. You don't. You, you're not gonna. You're not gonna go to Kenya or Tanzania or any other uh, uh, Swahili-speaking country and tell them they can't gatekeep Swahili. You're not gonna go to Nigeria and tell the Yoruba that they can't gatekeep Yoruba. You're not gonna tell the Hausa people they can't gatekeep Hausa. You're not gonna tell the Igbo. They can't get keep people. It's not like a crazy person. Ah. Ah. Wallahi. You're not going to go to these countries and tell these people they can't get keep their language. It is identifying marker of their culture. It identifies them. And you have to give respect and reverence to that. You can't tell the French people that they can't get keep French. It's literally in the fucking name. Tell the French they can't get keep French. See how well that goes for you. Tell the British they can't get keep the Queen's English. See how well that fucking goes for you. Tell the Chinese they can't get keep Mandarin or Cantonese. See how well that goes for you. It's not going to go well because you're not going to do it. Because you know... That is a fool's errand. And it's, it's ridiculous. And so 
to tell African Americans that they can't gatekeep African American English, African American vernacular English is foolish. And the reason I picked this topic for today is because I was watching a video uh, titled "Black People, Comma, You Don't Own This," and this is a YouTube video by um, a sister named Amala Ekpunobi, E-K-P-U-N-O-B-I, and she runs a segment called Unapologetic, and she, according to her, which is half black, half white, according to her, uh, growing up speaking AAVE gave her some identity issues. I don't understand what's the issue. Genetically, black plus anything equals black. We're the only folks who can go replicate ourselves in any other race of people or any other ethnicity of people. African plus anything equals African. It don't, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. If you don't believe me, um, Go do some go 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 look up some history on some on, on genetics, cause it'll tell you melanated skin is dominant, non-melanated skin is recessive, brown eyes are dominant, blue eyes are recessive. That I didn't come up with this. You know, black geneticists looked at it and was like, we already knew this, but yeah, white geneticists looked up was like, oh, we hate these motherfuckers, but oh shit, it's true. Think I'm kidding? Go look, go look up the old racist German dude who coined the phrase double helix. I didn't make it up. He said it. We already knew it. It is what it is. But anyway, um, this sister got on this episode and her tone and her manner uh, as it pertains to Black people gatekeeping um, African American vernacular English was so, so, so indicative of having a disdain for oneself and one's culture and one's identity and a disdain for what being black actually is because you got to understand something if you go to most parts of africa being black is not a it's not a common african term it's an african american term uh there's a sister from kenya um circa 2015 she was in her 30s if i remember correctly um she wrote a book and in her book, um, she said she had never been referred to, she had never been referred to as black in her life until she came to the United States. Right? By this time, she was on book number three. She had never been referred to as black in her life. Um, I've met many Africans. Uh, from several countries, Uganda, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, 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 Botswana, uh, you know what I'm saying? My roommate is Kenyan, uh, and, and, and I've bumped heads with a lot of Af Senegalese, uh, Sierra Leone, I've met them from all over the continent, right? And they all will tell you, like the term "black" as a reference to people, as a as as a as a, as a group, uh, as an ethnicity to be quote unquote and with air quotes black, is an American concept. Like that's not an African concept. That's an American concept, right? Now you hear these scholars from uh, the old Roman uh, Empire days, uh, where they were referred to. Uh, people as being black in color, but to refer to them as black as an identifiable group of people. Oh, the black people, you know, is, is, is an American term. 
It's an American concept. So I'm going to play a clip um, from this sister's video so you can hear uh, the, the foolishness that came out of this woman's mouth in regards to African-American vernacular English and black language. Um, cue this up real quick. It stuck with them, and it stayed for centuries and centuries. But I looked into this, and specifically a book by Tom Sowell called Black Rednecks and White Liberals, where he talks about the origins of African-American vernacular English. And I think you'll be shocked to hear this, too. It actually came from white Southerners living in the United States. And those white Southerners got it back from England, where they were living before immigrating to the United States, specifically Southern and Western England. And when these white Southerners came and took their roots in the United States, they were looked down upon by people living up in the North for the way that they spoke, the crime that they involved themselves in, how broken their families were. And Northern white people looked down upon Southern white people for the language, among all those other reasons that I stated before. So let's break down the differences in language between Northern and Southern white people in the United States of America. And this predates when black people were using this language. A Northern person would say, I am, you are, she isn't, it doesn't, I haven't. A Southern white person, specifically in Virginia, would say, I be, you be, she ain't, it don't, I ain't. Are we hearing the similarities to how some black people speak today? I'm hearing it. It's pretty clear. And if you want to go even further back into the 17th century, so the 1600s we're talking about, in Southern and Western England, here are some examples of words they would use. Instead of ask, they'd say ax, which if we look back at our glossary is right on the AAVE glossary. They, instead of you, they'd say y'all. Instead of door, they'd say do. Instead of this, they'd say dis. Instead of that, they'd say dat. And they even used chitlins, which is something that black people have attached themselves to, that word in particular, for uh, food that they eat, innards that they eat. So all of this to say, not only are black people, some black people, not all black people, choosing to gatekeep and hold on to a language that is not going to serve them, is not going to bring them success, prosperity, or respect, but they're also holding on to language that comes from white Southerners. <laughs> so here we are in this talk. All right, so that was a clip from this particular episode that I referenced, and you can hear in her tone and in her manner uh, that she has a great disdain for the functionality and application of African-American vernacular English, especially as it pertains to it being a acknowledgeable language. Because some white guy wrote a book about it, and because a lot of the articulation comes from broken English in Southern Europe. So let's talk a bit about that, right? Uh, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Oh, where did Columbus go? First of all, you got to look at Columbus. Christopher Columbus came from Europe under the funding of the Spanish crown in the late 1400s, right? So he decided he wanted to find another trade route to India and would go a different route. Where did he end up? The Caribbean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he was greeted by black folks. Well, he goes back, tells all his people of what he saw and these new lands and these new people, and they figured, oh, snap, we could go and take over these new lands. And all of these European people decided they wanted to migrate to where he just came from. Hence the Spanish conquistadors, the French, the Dutch, the, the, the Portuguese, right? The German, the Russian, the Welch. All of these people, right, uh, decided they were going to migrate from Europe and the surrounding areas 
to South to the Caribbean, Southern, Central, and Northern America. Now, they also said we're going to invade Africa and we're going to take free slave labor with us. Then we're going to take these people who speak a variety of different languages, put them in chains, haul them across an ocean, put them on blocks, sell them as property, whip them, beat them, rape them, tar and feather them, and tell them that they are to speak our language, not their own, to penalize them from reading a language, and tell them they have to respond in the language in which we speak to them, and then we, and then we ravish them in a negative way, and force them to procreate many cases so we could turn the offspring into fu to a future labor force and or sell them for profit so other people could turn them into future labor forces, right? And we're still not letting them speak in their native tongue. We're still not letting them study their rituals and way of life from where we took them from, but we're imposing our way of life upon them. We've given them our language. And because Europe did not send the best and the brightest, no, Europe opened the jails and said, oh, everybody who's in jail, you want to get out of jail, go to America. Insane asylums. You want to get out of the nut house, go to America. So they sent us their rejects. They sent us their, their rapists, their murderers, their thieves, their swindlers, their abusers, their drunks. They're mentally unstable. And they send them over here and a few and, and a few mid-range dignitaries came over here and said, we're going to use and abuse all of these people and we're going to force our way of life on them and we're going to give them in specificity our language. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Right. So, yes. African-American vernacular English originally derived from European English, the Queen's English. Don't correct my English, I speak the Queen's English. Yeah. You 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 have that it's it originated as a derivative, right? So you take the terminology in 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 you take the terminology applied and the grammatical rules applied in large part as a derivative of poorly spoken of a, of a, as a derivative of poorly spoken Queen's English or English English, um, and you add the tonal pronunciation and enunciation of African languages, predominantly Western African languages, everywhere from Liberia uh, down to uh, South Africa, right? Because at one point, from uh, 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 from the Ivory Coast to the southernmost part of Cameroon. At once, we're all the same group of people. We're all different tribes of the same group of people. That's why a lot of the languages sound so familiar. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about the Ivory Coast. You're talking about Cote d'Ivoire. You're talking about Benin, uh, Benin, Togo, Nigeria, Cameroon. They're all the same people. And the languages were almost the exact same. They spoke different variations of the same language. Right? Very tonal languages. You say it with your chest, not with your throat. Ah. So, you take these people, you beat their languages out of them, and you force them to speak your language, which you're not speaking properly, with their pronunciation and with their pronunciations and enunciations and their habits of speaking the languages they speak the way that they speak them you're going to get an entirely new language especially when you repeat those terms over and over and over and over and you add to this group of people you add a french accent and pronunciation. And in this group, you add a Spanish accent and pronunciation. 
This group of people, you, you have a Dutch accent and pronunciation. You have a British accent and pronunciation. You're going to get an entirely new language. That's how language is formed. You will get a new language by forcing people to stop speaking the language that they speak and then speak the way that you speak. You cannot teach them to properly pronounce it the way you pronounce it. You will accept what sounds similar. Yes, sir. Proper English. Yes, sir. Became yes, sir. Yes, sir. Master became massa. Meaning to be a burden of, not to be a leader over. Mm hmm. That part. So, finna, fixing to. Mm hmm. I'm finna, man, I'm finna hit the stove. Stove versus stove, stove, stove versus store, dough versus door. And every other and every other commonly black colloquialism you can apply to it. What up though? What's happening? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What it do? In Detroit. What up though? What up though, my baby? You good? You go to Chicago. What up, Joe? What's going on, fam? You go down to Texas. You go down to Texas. Say, what it do? You go to Atlanta. Hey, what, what, what what's happening, Shada? What poppin', baby? You go to New Orleans. Say, say, what y'all doing around here? You you go you go to Memphis. Hey, what up, man? Hey, man, yo. Hey, man, we finna go to the store. Hey, man, yo. It's not popper soda. It's a cold drink in New Orleans. They're not Nike Air Force Ones. They're G Nikes. Detroit, it ain't forces. Chicago, they white lows. So, African American vernacular English is, in fact, a language. But once again, to officially declare it and acknowledge it as a language means you have to acknowledge and you have to identify and acknowledge the people from whence it came. It is not African American vernacular English if there's no African pronunciation and enunciation. You just have Southern European English. You just have poor pronunciation and enunciation pronunciation and enunciation of English English or the Queen's English. Don't correct my English. I speak the Queen's English. Yeah. So, the fact that she tries to discredit African American vernacular English and discredit the people from whence it belongs to, from whence it came, it you cannot say that you have a language or a dialect of language spoken African American vernacular English, and you have a group of people spoken African Americans, and go they have nothing to do with each other. They didn't come from the same group of people. They're not. They're 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 not part of the same group. When the language or the dialect that you're referring to is the term given for the language and or dialect spoken by the previously mentioned people. That's this that's that's crazy. That's that's the equivalent of saying that Russian Living in Germany, speaking Russian. Oh snap! You, uh, you can't, you, uh, you can't speak Russian. You can't gatekeep Russian in Germany. When Russian's a Germanic language, it's a, it's a, it's a Slavic language. <laughs> yeah, like that. 
you, you're not going to tell a Russian you can't speak Russian? You're not going to tell a Chinese person they can't speak Mandarin or Cantonese? Or they can't gatekeep Mandarin or Cantonese? Go tell a Mongol he, can't, he or she can't speak Mongolian or whatever the applicable name is for the language or languages they speak. Go tell a Filipino they can't speak Tagalog and they can't gatekeep Tagalog. <laughs> I laugh at anybody trying to. It, that's that that's foolish. That that is foolish. You have a group of people with a given name, and you have a language with a given name, and its given name is because it is its given name identifies the people from which it came from. African Americans, African American vernacular English. Duh. We all know it's a derivative of American. It was originally a derivative of American English that became its own language and it gave it a political identity. And now we assume said political identity and said, no, 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 no. Since, since you gave it a name and you tried to negatively contextualize and negatively politicize us with the name, we're going, we're going to assume said name and go, nope, you can't have it. We own it. We owned it before. You just decided to create a public identifiable marker for it. That's like saying, that's, that's, that's the same thing as saying, oh man, there's a thousand, there's a thousand different types of canines out here. And we're going to identify this one as pit bulls. Oh, you're not a canine, you're a pit bull. No, motherfucker, you're still a canine. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh yeah, we just have a marker that says you're a pit bull. Yeah. But the first time that dog stands up and goes, I'm a pit bull, and they go, No, you're not. That's not how she, that's that's not how that works, big dog. You can't you cannot you cannot call a people a name call the way that they speak the same name and then tell them they can't control the narrative behind the way that they fucking speak. Every person controls the narrative behind the way that they speak. And every group speaks and controls the narrative behind whence they speak. You're not going to tell a Nigerian that they don't speak the language that they speak and they don't have the right to tell you that you're not speaking the language properly or that's not how you say it. I am not going to go to Kenya or to Tanzania and tell them the proper way to speak Swahili. I'm not. I don't speak it. It's not my language. So I can't tell them how to do it. And if I go there, and I speak it incorrectly, and they correct me on it. I have to respect it. Why? Because it's not my language. It's their language. I don't speak it, but they do. So if I try to assume it, and I'm not of those people in that particular section of that particular language. Now, the way they speak it in Kenya is different than the way they speak it in Tanzania. So if I go to Tanzania, and I want to be respectful of Tanzanians. I have to speak it the way they speak it. If I go to Kenya and I want to be respectful of Kenyans, I have to speak it the way they speak it. Otherwise, I will be lost in the proper translation and understanding. I don't speak Igbo, I'm Yoruba. So if I go to a, to a to a Igbo person and I say something to them in Igbo, if I say it wrong, they correct me. I have to respect it. Why? It's that language. So, for a non-black person or a non-African American who goes to an African American speaking African American vernacular English, and an African American goes, hey, hey, just time out. This ain't for you. Stay in your lane. <laughs> They're not wrong. It's their language. You're, you're, not gonna, you're not going to come from Miami where they speak a particular set of colloquialisms. And come to Detroit and try to speak like you from Detroit. We're going to know you're not from Detroit, my dude. You, you're not going to say it the same way. 
You're not going to have the same points of emphasis. You're not going to have the same pronunciation and enunciation. You're not going to have the same references. Your references are going to be a little different. Why? Because you grew up in a place where your references were different. And that's not bad. It just is. But I'm not going to go to Miami trying to speak like people in Miami. I'm not from Miami. I don't speak like that. Though we may speak the same language, we may not use some of the, we may not use all of the same terminology, all of the same colloquialisms, all of the same reference points. So if I go to, so if I go to Texas, if I go to Dallas, Fort Worth, right? And I say, man, hold up. They know exactly what I'm talking about. But if I go to Detroit, if you've never been to Texas and you don't understand how Texas, you don't understand Texas slang and Texas culture, you don't get the reference. You don't understand the expression. Man, hold up. Don't fool. Calm it down. Don't talk about it. Yeah, I go to Dallas. I go to uh, 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 I go to Houston. Go to part San Antonio, Corpus Christi. You know what I'm talking about? All up and through there. Yeah, that part. All that. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, hey, they, them boys coming down, boy. Them boys, they were, mm, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? They were, had the super poker. Them boys out there swinging with the candy paint. Fifth wheel hanging, trunk banging, you know what I'm saying, riding book, you know what I'm saying, got the TVs and everything in there, bitch, swinging on them boy coming down, man, hold up, unless you understand how they speak there, you have no idea what the fuck I just said, and effectively, I've spoken a different language, I know what it means, because I've been there, lived in Texas. I, 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 I communicate with people from Texas regularly, so I understand the colloquialism. I understand the speech. I understand the dialects. But I can go to parts of Louisiana, and I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Why? Because in certain parts, they speak Creole. I don't speak Creole. I got a who speak Creole. So I refer to him like, hey, man, what are they talking about? What does this mean? Because where I'm from, we don't use that terminology, right? So, African-American vernacular English. If you ain't black, it's not for you. It is something specifically for black people that identifies black people. It is our language. And I identify as a black person. Yes, I am of Nigerian heritage. Yes, my bloodline has a Nigerian origin. I had a Nigerian flag in front of my house. I got Nigerian patches on a lot of my a lot of my attire. I put Nigerian lapel pins on. But I also wear Juneteenth t-shirts and attire. I also wear the African-American heritage flag. I also fly the Juneteenth flag. I also fly the Pan-African flag because I'm a Pan-African. So, I'm a black person. And I grew up speaking African-American vernacular English. And it is for black people. It's literally FUBU. It is for us, by us. Now, how did we how did we come to speaking it? It is in written form and in grammatical construct. In large part derived from poorly spoken European English. <laughs> Predominantly British. But when you add that African tonal emphasis on that, the, Af the West African tonal pre-pronunciation, pronunciation, and enunciation, you get African American vernacular English. Ebonics, the official language of black people. And my last point, code switching. Code switching is the AAVE term for being bilingual and one of your and one of your languages being AAVE. It is the ability to speak AAVE plus a, another language and con and commonly in common reference to AAVE versus American English. Right? Or 
whatever your native tongue is to American English. That is the common assumption. So if you're a Spanish speaking person, in large part, you speak Spanglish. If you're a Spanish speaker and an English speaker, large part, you speak Spanglish. Why? Especially in America, there because there's some words in Spanish that don't exist in American English. There's some words in American English that don't exist in Spanish. And there are some terms and some expressions that you can kind of correlate. But there are certain terms in AAVE that does not translate to American English. Like, then a bitch. Then a hoe. Perfect example. Man, it's hot than a bitch outside. Man, it's hotter than a hoe in this bitch. Man, it was so, man, it was hotter than two squirrels fucking in a wool stocking is up. And the expression, in this bitch or in this hoe, it doesn't literally mean inside of a female dog or inside of a prostitute. It means inside of the given physical location. Man, it's hotter than a bitch outside. It's an expression to identify an extreme level of heat. And it exemplifies your discomfort. Man, it's cold than a bitch. It's colder than a hoe. Man, it's cold as fuck. The expression as fuck. In no other language that I know of does the expression as fuck exist. It doesn't. But it, it exists in AV as fuck. Man, it's hot as fuck. It's cold as fuck. Man, that shit, that's cool as fuck. Yeah. In no other language do we use the expression that part. T-H-A-T space P-A-R-T. Commonly pronounced D-A-T P-A-R-T. Dead part. Which is an expression meaning I agree with what was said. And that section of what was said. So if if someone says five different things and at the end they say something and I agree with what was said at the end, I'm like, that part. The expression, what he said, what she said. Those are expressions. Those are expressions that are uh, native to AAVE and people use them all the time but those are AAVE terms those are black language terms black American English a a a African American vernacular English Ebonics that's black language that is language derived of the combination of descendants of enslaved Africans in America, you might have a little twang on yours because you were raised by people who put a twang on their words when they speak. You might have been raised, you might have a, a more of a Southern draw or a Western draw or this sort of emphasis or that sort of emphasis when you pronounce certain words. Like I had a guy from Maine I used to work with and for the life of him, he would not say Michigan. He would say Michigan. Mm -hmm. He would. He's from Maine. He was pronounced it Michigan. Oh, you're from Michigan. I'm from Michigan. So, you know the you all versus y'all. Simple. African American vernacular English. All right. And like I said, man, color switching is just being multilingual. And every black person in America is multilingual. You can speak American English and AAVE. That makes you multilingual. You can code switch. And code switching means that you're going to talk this way with this group of people and talk that way with that group of people. And you change the way that you talk based on your audience and your environment, generally whether you're in a personal or a professional setting. And it's not just you change the content of your speech. You change the pronounce, pronunciation and enunciation. You change the applicable terminology. I'm not going to go into a corporate office full of uh, men and women 
in suits and ties and to give a presentation on logistics because I'm a business owner um, and uh, walk in and greet them. What up, though? How y'all doing? Hey, y'all ready to kick this off? Let's do it. It's not how I'm going to speak. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? Is everyone ready? Is everyone prepared? Are we missing anyone? Okay. My name is, and, and we're off. Here we are. I'm going to use proper English. Why? Because that is the preferred language for that setting. Everybody understands. I can communicate well. I'm very articulate at my communication. They understand American English, so I will speak American English. But when I go hang with my with, with, with my friends from Africa, various countries, ah, ah, you silly, ah, wahala, no wahala, ah, I'll find them. Idi. <laughs> ah, don't be a good. Ah, I don't lie. But when I'm in when I'm in the city, hey, what up, though, my baby? You good? How you doing? What's poppin'? Look, hey, hey, we finna hit the G store real quick. Y'all was like, shit, hey man, what happened? What you want, girl? You know, man, hey, man, take it down through that. I'm talking about. Hey, she came through. It was. You did. It was, yeah. It, it was a good night, your boy did his thing. This is your host, Young Tony Man. It's the Black Shot Podcast. What up, dog? I'm at your neck, son. <laughs>